All right, welcome to video number seven in our series on sports sponsorship. This video is focused on a topic that might feel like it's coming out of left field at you, but is an important one as we begin to understand and put together um, our thoughts around building successful corporate partnerships. And this one is ambush marketing or ambushing. So ambush marketing and sports sponsorship, it's a critical topic to consider and to understand if we're going to build successful corporate partnerships for our sponsors of our sport organizations. So what is ambushing anyway? The definition that I have here is that it is the practice by which a rival company attempts to associate its products with an event that already has an official sponsor. So a rival company tries to associate with an event that, that its rival has already purchased a sponsorship to become an official partner. So the picture that you see here is an example of Coca-Cola, ambush marketing, an international soccer event, right? Pepsi was the partner, but Coca-Cola ran advertisements featuring national team flags on their Coke bottles during that time. That practice by Coca-Cola in that example is to try to gain the association with the event without paying for the sponsorship required to gain access to the event. So why is ambushing a thing? Putting it simply, sponsorship is expensive, right? You know, if you think back to the, the conversation on leveraging and activation, it is true. If you buy a sports sponsorship as a business, you also will need to spend additionally to leverage that asset, right? So if you can just spend on the leveraging and not on the sponsorship, you've saved money. And if you can still gain the same strategic advantage, then why would you not do that? Well, that's why this has become a thing. So simply again, sponsorships can be expensive. And if you can gain the benefit without the cost, why would you not do it? Another example here that uses the World Cup uh, for soccer, Pringles was not an official you know, junk food partner. I know that's not the category we'd use, but Pringles was not the, the, the chip uh, company that was sponsoring the World Cup. However, no one's stopping Pringles from creating Pringles cans with soccer balls on it, right? I'm calling them Pringles. So um, you see that they're trying to, during a time period when people are thinking about this and are connected to this type of event, they're trying to borrow from our association, our association with that. Is that okay? Does that completely derail the whole point of sports sponsorship? No. And maybe it totally depends. There's a wide range of types of ambush marketing that can be engaged in. There's a graphic on the right that I know my image partly covers up, but it's in the Cornwell text that talks about uh, sort of the axis in which ambush marketing initiatives exists upon. You've got on the vertical axis, intentional acts and unintentional acts, and on the horizontal axis, legal acts and illegal acts. So ambush marketing initiatives tend to fall in one of those four categories or somewhere <clears throat> on those two continuums. So um, if, we, <clears throat> if we work our way from uh, what's on the left side, the illegal things, strong forms of ambush marketing and unaware ambush marketing might fall on the illegal um, side of things, meaning you might do something that is actually against a law in a country, and you might know that, or you might not know that, right? So legal, Ill, uh, illegal, but possibly intentional, possibly not intentional. On the legal side of things, we've got incidental ambushing effects and clever ambush marketing. So the two examples that I've shown you so far probably fall under the category of clever ambush marketing. They, under the assumption that they weren't trying to find a way to get their um, signage into a stadium, or they weren't trying to hijack a broadcast and put their advertisements on their digital streams. Assuming they're not doing something like that, they're just trying to be clever with it. They're trying to say the big game instead of the Super Bowl, right? We'll see that a, a whole bunch around Super Bowl time in the U.S. So um, those tend to fall under the clever category. Sometimes a brand might use soccer or football or something like that as um, a focal point of how it markets its product or service and that may cross over with a major international event in that sport it has an ambushing effect but they didn't really even mean to do it and it's on the legal end of things so so it's acceptable um, 
the, the, the slide here gives you more information on what these types of ambush, ambushing, uh, you know, strategies look like. <laughs> so again, back to this question, does this completely derail um, the role of sponsorship? No, but it does create an area of consideration that we as sponsor, as those selling sponsorships need to once again understand so that we can, can consult through that process. It does create the possibility, you know, the possible strategic uh, objective of one of our sponsors, competitors, um, you know, to, to kind of, you know, take away some of their attention. So we as a sport organization need to work to try to avoid the possibility for ambush marketing to occur. So when ambushing, I'll give you an example of um, a sport organization considering this eventually, you know, it's surprised that it didn't right away. But pictured here, you've got in the background uh, Target Center, where the Timberwolves and Lynx play. Uh, obviously pictured from Target Field, where the Twins play. So both of these venues have the same naming rights partner. Um, what you'll see on the outside of Target Center, across uh, from right field there, is a Sanford Health logo. Um, Sanford Health at that time was not a sponsor of the Minnesota Twins. Now, I don't know if there was another health provider, healthcare provider that was a sponsor that they were trying to, um, you know, uproot with this, with this strategy. But I do know that Sanford Health at this time was not a partner with the twins, but what they were a partner with was the Timberwolves and Lynx. So they were able to purchase signage on the side of Target Center that could be seen from outside or from inside Target Field. Now that, you know, may or may not have worked. I don't know what the, uh, what the outcomes were that Sanford Health was looking for, nor if they were able to measure and, and accomplish them. But what I will say is that's a perfect example of ambushing. Wells Fargo tried to do the same thing uh, during the Super Bowl when U.S. Bank Stadium hosted it. They wanted to put a gigantic Wells Fargo sign that was lit up red and yellow that everyone could see from the Goodyear blimp and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, U.S. Bank Stadium, the Minnesota Vikings, and the NFL worked with the city of Minneapolis to reduce the size of Wells Fargo's sign in downtown East. They lit it up big time, but it had to be a certain size. Since this particular example, Target has obviously put their logo on the outside, or the dog looking in uh, to Target Field, a creative activation strategy that I'm surprised they didn't do right away. Um, but ultimately, it took a little bit of time. So this, you know, just another example of how ambushing can take place. And again, not illegal necessarily, but also not, um, you know, maybe not paid for. So why is all of this bad for sponsorship? Well, the reality of why it's all bad is related to the reason why sponsorships are bought to begin with. Sponsorships are bought for exclusivity. The reason that, that you know, that this exclusivity um, concept is so important is it's ultimately the thing that is valued the most by corporate partners in the sport industry. The idea that, you know, Target can market to its prospective customers where, you know, Walmart or some other competitor can't, that is a great opportunity. We don't have that in social media. We don't have that when we're walking down the street somewhere. We don't pay for that. You know, we don't often, when we buy advertising, we don't often pay for it in a way that shuts out our competition. Sponsorships have that potential. So because they have that potential and because it has, because sponsorship has been so effective, Ambush marketing has become really popular around sports sponsors, around sports sponsorships and around sporting events. So now it becomes to some degree the obligation of the sport organization to put a stop to that or to reduce the likelihood that it would happen. Because if it does happen, the competitive advantage gained and paid for by the sponsor is going to be lost. And if that's the case, then back to the idea of what we measure, we're not going to be able to measure something to say that it was successful. We're not going to be able to deliver on the objectives. And in fact, we may create an environment where the competitor actually gains some sort of advantage because they didn't spend as much. So there's so many different things that might come up related to the challenges that ambush marketing brings to the table. So why it's bad is ultimately it erodes the exclusivity that's paid for. So how do we protect against that? Uh, 
McKelvey and Grady offer some strategies that can be used to protect against ambush marketing. Number one is pre-event education and PR, which essentially just means to talk up the sponsorship in advance so that consumers actually know who the partner is. Second is on-site policing and the establishment of clean zones where only the corporate partner can be in. This is tremendously popular with big events like the World Cup and the Super Bowl. You know, anytime you see a fan zone, that's ultimately a clean zone for the partners for the partner brands one that other brands cannot get in. And if you were to walk in with, an, with the wrong brand water bottle or something like that, it would be taken from you and thrown away. Um, third, robust contractual language. This is partly related to ensuring that the partner knows what you're getting, what they're getting out of the agreement, but it also uh, allows both sides of the agreement to understand if an ambushing initiative happens, is there uh, some make good for that partner so that they can be taken care of and that we can be sure that their money was not wasted. And then fourth is to just work with, um, you know, your local government or, you know, state government or even the national government to try to enforce some sort of create or enforce existing trademark or intellectual property laws that are maybe being violated or, you know, the envelope being pushed uh, on. So there's a big question that's left here. So ambush marketing is a thing. It has been effective properties or brands get really creative in how they do it around sport uh, events. We know that as the sport industry, we try to build in a lot of different protections against that. We just saw, saw some of them on the last slide. So should you acknowledge ambush marketing at the beginning of the process of building a relationship to try to sell a sponsorship to a prospective future cor corporate partner? And the answer is, it depends. Um, you know, the answer is, it depends on the relationship you're building. There might be an instance where you don't really want to go down that road because they've had a negative experience with it in the past, or the opposite might be true. They've had a negative experience with it in the past, so you need to show them how that's not going to happen here. It, it totally depends. It depends on the relationship that you have as you're going through this process of trying to sell the partnership. It also uh, depends on whether or not you think it's it's a realistic possibility. Um, you know, if you talk, like, if you're selling sponsorship for some small local 5K race, that's not really something that's usually going to be ambushed by some non-partner. So it might be a non-factor. If you're talking about the Super Bowl, then yeah, you are going to have to acknowledge and work your way through that. So the, the answer is it ultimately depends as to whether or not you should uh, you should do that. So I've given you a lot of examples already, but the link here that you see as a case to close is really eight different cases to close. If you click on that, you'll see eight different creative ambush marketing campaigns that worked to some degree. And the image that I thought was interesting was Fiat's uh, ambushing of Volkswagen uh, for a series of days when the uh, Google Street View truck was going by. Fiat pulled up a Fiat vehicle and parked it in front of Volkswagen's headquarters. I think that's kind of interesting. So then you'd go to Google Street View and at the Volkswagen headquarters, you would see a competitor's car. Um, my guess would be if we look that up now that you know they've had the Google Street View car go back through, but I thought that was a creative one. It's one of the examples that you'll see in that eight ambush marketing campaigns link if you follow through to that. So that's all that I have for this video once again. And as always, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I do appreciate it.